If we can gather our hearts for a moment of prayer. Lord God, we would seek your face, but cannot see it directly. But we seek the inspiration and guidance of your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So those words and those meditations will focus on the passage from Matthew this morning. Um, as we have been going through Matthew and following Jesus on his teaching and ministry, now has come to Jerusalem, is coming toward the end, has built up momentum on both sides. Those who love him and follow him, those who feel threatened and bothered by him, and those tend to be the powers that be. So here come the Pharisees and the Herodians representing powers that be, both from the temple side of things and from the uh, Herod King Roman side of things. And they come at Jesus with a whole bunch of insincere flattery. Jesus, we know that you have integrity, blah, 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 trying to draw him into their trap. And they ask him this question. Actually, it's more of a riddle buried in a question, wrapped in a conundrum, hidden in a trap, to misquote Winston Churchill badly. It's taxes, that topic which has been slippery all through history. It is now, and it certainly was then. Because of the Roman presence and their domination, and the Jews and their loyalty to the law of Moses, they ask, is it right? Other interpretations say, is it lawful? They asked. Well, there was Roman law which said definitely, yes, we're the law of the land. And though they had the guys with the spears and the swords to back them up and enforce the law, of course, it's right to pay your taxes. But many of the Jews and their leaders interpreted the law of Moses as saying, no, no, we shouldn't be doing that. Only, only to God, only to the temple. And the Jews who were surrounding Jesus tended to be the more, the lower in society. They were the ones suffering the worst from all these taxes. And they would have been listening very closely to an answer Jesus would have to a, a question like that. If he had said yes, he could be seen as a collaborator, as a traitor. But if he said no, he'd be seen by the Romans as seditious, advocating rebellion and anarchy. Well, that was the trap. Jesus would be in trouble either way. But Jesus was having none of it. He refuses to take the bait. In fact, he disarms the trap. He borrows a coin. He points out the fact that the image of Caesar is on the coin and says, well, then give to Caesar what is his and to God what is his. Boom. Mic drop. Check and mate. With this answer, he can't be accused of either sedition or collaboration. And it shut up his enemies. And I'm sure it pleased his followers. <laughs> they just saw the Pharisees and the Herodians get outfoxed by Jesus. And I imagine they were like, yeah, way to go. But, you know, when they thought about it, it might have been more like, 
Yeah, way to go. Wait, what? What did he actually say? What does it actually mean for us? How do we actually do that? You know, it's pretty much the same questions and reaction that we have 2,000 years later. Sounds great, but what does it actually mean for us? It's more of a mystery wrapped in an enigma hidden in a paradox. Give to Caesar what is his. Give to God what is his. You know, the answer to that, though, can be very easy. That is, if you have an agenda. If you have a political agenda, this, this passage has been used throughout the centuries to support pro-tax and anti-tax, pro-government and anti-government. All kinds of different agendas have used this to support their points, their agendas throughout the centuries. But if you don't have an agenda, if you're just looking for God's word in this, then you're left with a lot of questions to ponder. Questions like, well, what actually belongs to Caesar? What belongs to God? And how do we give to God what belongs to God? Seeking some form of answer or direction to those questions is what we consider the process of discernment. What do we find? What do we draw out? Where do we find the truth in it all? So let's see what, where deter, discernment might lead us. Now remember, Jesus pointed to the image of Caesar on the coin. So it's pretty clear, I guess, that the things that the coin represents belong to Caesar. It bears his image. But what bears the image of God? What belongs to God? We can't, according to our earlier reading, see the face of God directly. But what about his image somehow? How do we find that? How do we see that? How do we find out what marks God's? If God is the creator of everything, then maybe the answer is everything. But then God doesn't need anything from us. He already has everything. And what he doesn't have, he can create. So how do we give to God what is God's? Well, I think the key to that question might lie in the question I asked before it. What bears the image of God? Again, we cannot see his face directly, but it doesn't mean we can't see the image of God's divine love in this world. Where do we find the image of compassion, caring, selflessness, and love? Well, I'll tell you where I find it. I find it in the people of God. People whose hearts are filled with the Holy Spirit and with the true love of God. I definitely see it at St. Mark's. I see it in the devoted worship of the people of God and the fellowship of God's people here. I see it in the outreaches to those who need the love of God. Man, things like math works and wordplay or math adventures and wordplay and all kinds of mission and caring things bring God's love to people. I see it in our new rector, Joan. Look at what she has done to establish a vital ministry just as a pandemic has hit and how she has done it. I see, I see the image of God there, I do. I see it and I hear it in George's amazing, beautiful music and in George himself. 
and in all the talented people who share their music. It's a bit of a blessing with this format that we've gotten to hear many of those individually. We got to hear Barbara this morning and the choir when they did sing. I, I, I see, I hear the image of God there. I see it in Chris's pictures that come up on the screen and the technology and the way it's used so that we can have these gatherings. I see the image of God there. I see it in Father Jim, in his words and his presence that just seem to be touched by the holy. And so many other wonderful people here. I see it in the church itself and the property around it, which I miss. Well, I could go on a lot, as could you, I'm sure. But if we're called to give to God what is God's, and the image of God marks what is God, then St. Mark's must definitely be God's within the walls and beyond them. You know, governments can stamp their images on currency to be used far and wide in the commerce of our society for obtaining almost anything by almost anyone including churches. However, none of that can compare with the commerce that created the universe and gave life and breath to each of us and holds our ultimate destiny and saves us from the brokenness of this world and from our own brokenness. When we give to God, we are participating in that ongoing commerce. There's a further difference between how we give to Caesar and how we give to God. Caesar's image on that coin and all government images are backed by the power of armies and police forces and court systems that enforce their demands. So when it comes to giving to Caesar what is his, I recommend you do it or you could end up in jail. On the other hand, you could end up in the White House, but that'd be only if you were trying to be Caesar. I promised myself I wouldn't go there. But in contrast to giving to Caesar, giving to God is not done in response to a command or a threat. It's a calling. It's an invitation to participate in the commerce of the love of God at work in the world. It's a response of love. As Jesus said, as I love, you shall love. And he said, freely you have received, freely give. So maybe through the work of discernment, we can begin to see the difference between what is Caesar's and what is God's, between the things that this world demands of us and the things that God calls and invites us to be part of. But there's one more question I think needs to be addressed. As we seek to find and strike this balance between the things of the world and the realm of God, what happens when the demands of a government clash with the calling of God in Christ? Jesus said to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. What happens when the government demands of us something that interferes with us following that great command of Christ. The first few centuries of Christians found that out. Oh, they despised the oppression of their Roman overseers, but they remained loyal citizens, paying their taxes, following laws, concentrating their efforts on loving God and other people. But until they were told to renounce 
their devotion to Christ and pledge their loyalty only to Caesar. That they could not do. That they could not give to Caesar. Their hearts and their devotion belonged only to God. Many died, refusing to give to Caesar what was God's. As a result, they bore the image of God in a way that changed the world. So as we consider what we give to whom, let's begin by giving our hearts, our lives, our souls to God. I don't think any of us will be asked to be martyrs. But is there some sacrifice that we can make to help St. Mark's continue to bear the image of God within and beyond the walls? To him be all glory now and forever.